Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox here, and we're doing some going further than Hadoop general remarks. So last year we did Spark and other detailed technologies, Kubernetes. This year we're doing something a little different. After finishing MapReduce and Hadoop, rather than doing all these detailed technologies, we're giving an overview of distributed systems, which typically build on top of Hadoop. And so that's what we have now. It covers Spark, Storm, Heron, and Twister 2. And uh, we first have some very general comments on, on the field. And these general remarks introduce the global AI and modeling supercomputer and um, the general approach of most of industry and implicitly academia today. All right, so these are what we can look at. Um, Spark, Flink, which is essentially the same as Spark for, your, for you. Storm and Heron, which are almost identical. Kafka and the publish subscribe technology, which RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, and Twister2. We could also, but don't mention TensorFlow which is a machine learning environment, because uh, this course is really on the distributed systems behind machine learning, not on machine learning. We have a system called Harp from Indiana University, which has a similar focus on machine learning, uh, like TensorFlow, but it explicitly is integrated with Hadoop, and so has some interesting features. So, when I was at a Microsoft meeting this summer, they explicitly said, we're doing the global AI supercomputer. Um, and that's the entire sort of endeavor of the systems group at Microsoft. And they implicitly said, that's what all the other companies, Facebook, Google, and Amazon are doing. So what is the global AI supercomputer? It's the giant machine formed by all the world's clouds, and all the world's edge. Inside either both the edge or the cloud are lots and lots of processing units. Um, things on the edge have a few processing units each, but there are lots of them. Things in the middle are not so many, 600 or so um, uh, large uh, data centers, according to Cisco. Uh, but each of those large data centers has lots and lots of computers, maybe up to 100,000 or so individual computers. And we need to look at it as lots of things and as one big thing. Because one big thing is where is the great thought. The thought which subsumes, sums up all everybody else's thoughts comes from looking at it as a single machine. It is sort of the difference between um, parallel computing with the uh, integrated fashion, and lots of individual parallel decisions. You can either think of each of your cuddly teddy bears going to the cloud and independently speaking to you, or all the teddy bears in the world linking together on the cloud to make some cosmic decision about the roles of teddy bears. Okay, so as Microsoft says, we have the intelligent edge and the intelligent cloud. If they'd written this a few years ago, they would not have stressed the intelligent edge. They might have even stressed intelligent. Uh, two trend, recent trends are edge and intelligence, AI and edge. And the intelligent edge is important because that's where actually most of the data comes from. Not all of it comes from the edge. Uh, it collects data, makes local decisions, takes actions. And there are all sorts of devices, cameras, speakers, watches, IoT, self-driving cars robots, etc. And if you do things there, you get um, low latency. Probably there's no cosmic security issue with your local robot or teddy bear. Uh, there's more problems probably on your cloud. Where in the cloud just integrates and aggregates everything. It trains models. And it has effectively infinite computing resources. And it's not necessarily trusted because it's getting Lots of data with a lot of which is on not being properly uh, vetted, and it's also subject to attacks and things. 
All right, so this is what we call the global AI, and I added the word modeling, because we want to not just uh, use machine learning on data, we want to do ab initio simulations. To, to uh, be able to build an next self-driving car, we have to simulate it. Both the car itself and its uh, activities, and but also the battery, which is key to cost-effective electric cars, say. All right, but if we all agree on a supercomputer, we all agree on AI, I just add modeling. Notice um, it's logically uh, centralized, but it is physically distributed. As I said there are over 600 hyperscale data centers. These are the very large data centers. And it's owned by a few, but the non-trivial number of major players. Maybe, a, I don't know, a dozen big players and even more medium-sized players. And then there's a huge distributed set of devices. And uh, those devices at the edge are linked to fog, which is sort of halfway between the cloud and the edge. Fog is the square root of the edge times the fog. And they form logically and physically distributed. Notice the cloud is logically centralized. I mean, you think of it as a single entity. You do not think of the edge as a single entity. Um, the edge is mainly data. It has some computing, but in general, you try to arrange things so the most difficult computing is done on the cloud. And there was a thing called the computational grid in the past. It was a set of distributed entities, so it has some similarity to the edge, but it was more a collection of computer centers, and also it was also computing oriented, not data oriented. Um, and when we think about the fog, a car is a good example of a fog, because a car has hundreds of sensors, hundreds of IoT edge devices, and it has you know its own NVIDIA GPU and CPUs to do the processing for each car. Everything is heterogeneous. Sometimes there'll be GPU. Use sometimes small memory, sometimes large memory, and the uh, they will have accelerators, which is FPGAs, neuromorphic accelerators, quantum accelerators, and disks will be arranged in all sorts of different structures. And we, uh, then you can say this um, slide set is discussing the software model for the GAI MSC, the Global AI and Modeling Supercomputer. Okay, here are some pictures of the world. Here is a, I just went to the Google and typed probably fog or something like that. And one thing I should point out, as well as the Internet of Things, there's the important industrial Internet of Things, which is the Internet of Things being built by industry, General Electric, uh, Johnson Controls, the people who, um, and also Tesla, the P and, G and GM and things like that. The people who are building devices on the edge and want to manage those devices. <coughs> They're building the industrial Internet of Things. Um, and that complements the consumer Internet of Things, which is Alexa, smartphones, and things like that. Here we have the IoT over here. And uh, all, everything, whether it be consumer or Industry has cloud, fog, edge. And sometimes people include the fog and the edge. Sometimes the edge, the, the, you separate the devices and consider the, the thing at the, this to have another layer, devices, fog, eh, eh, dev, devices, and, and fog. And some, I mean, that, you can be a little con confusing. But basically, everybody agrees what's going on. You have a whole set of devices. You have some nearby computers, and you can actually the clouds themselves can be arranged hierarchically with a cloud in India, a cloud in Indianapolis, and a cloud feeding into clouds in Chicago and things like that. So every and because the cloud is distributed, and um, so here is the. Um, this particular person's vision with roof computing, which is um, has wireless uh, 
wireless networking and so on. And notice a critical feature, which is real time. If you do things on the edge, you can get answers in microseconds, tens of microseconds. If you do things in the cloud, you're going to take 100 milliseconds to go to the cloud and get back again. Now, 100 milliseconds is not a huge length of time. And uh, it's actually quite satisfactory for most consumers. It is not satisfactory if your robot is about to collide with the wall or your car, self-driving car is about to hit a truck. Some things have to be done in real time, all contained to the edge. So here we have roof with defined real time, on-site operations facilitation. So it is basically a fog concept so right near the edge. All right, now we come to a slide from Dan Reed and the Big Data Exascale Computing Consortium, Jack Dongara and Pete Beckman. And it has a rather nice picture of the size to size complexity ratio. Uh, and each of these is meant to be that um, the total cost in each column is about the same. <coughs> so you, if you have a, a few billion dollar facilities, then you have a billion nano size devices on the edge. So you get um, the co you know, a constant multiplier ending up at a few billions at each, in each column. And um, this is all due to some trade off between uh, cost and physical size that will, will always make this happen. Actually, on Amazon, the Adafruit's uh, $10 when I tried to buy them, but never mind. All right, here's another interesting slide, because there's another form of edge, which is that instruments the scientists have. <coughs> now, NEON is the collection of environmental instruments, and those, that is, some of them are going to be like attached to squirrels and things like that. They're going to be like your Adafruit's, very small. Others will be bigger. They'll be on localized tars servicing localized regions, looking for flooding or, or, or drought and things like that. Here we have another interesting example, the Square Kilometer Array, the next generation radio telescope, large scale um, sky survey telescope, which is a, which are div astronomical observational devices, typically having multiple Components which uh, then have to all be integrated together to get the answer. Here we have Atlas, which is the, these are all so-called big science. Atlas is the one of the, the accelerate one of the uh, detectors. The other big one is CMS at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, which discovered the Higgs boson. And so here we have big and few, but the neon is from a bunch of small devices. And here we have various. Um, Examples of lots of little devices, Fitbits, um, vehicles, the array of things is in Chicago mounted on, on uh, telephone poles and things like that. If we look at the um, challenges for understanding the AI and modeling supercomputer, uh, we have to know, look at the words, global. And it says that we better be able to take services from many different sources, a Google machine learning, an Amazon real-time service, and join them together. AI says we better use the very remarkable progress of machine learning. Modeling says we have to both do large-scale simulations to study the net secrets of material science to manufacture the next car, and the, the modeling the performance of a new giant system installed. Um, and we also have to be a supercomputer. And supercomputer just means big. It just What is a supercomputer? Just a large computer. And whether that large computer is uh, simulating a battery or listening to a bunch of Alexas is still a large computer. And as we said, we have the intelligence and we better put the cloud have high performance computing because if we're going to do big data, Almost inevitably, we have to use high performance computing. We have to have an intelligent HPC fog and an intelligent HPC edge. Well, it's not quite so clear what an HPC edge is. 
although every, usually uh, edge devices from the beginning of time, due to power and other constraints, they're always designed with, you, with efficiency as a major criteria. So we have all these things living around, and so they're sort of swimming around in the world. I call it an ether. If you want to know what an ether is, look, up, look, up, look it up. It was invented by physicists to describe what was going to carry the force of gravity and things like that and transmit it from star to star. Uh, nowadays, we don't think there is the ether is not real. But it's a nice term and indicates that we, even if we don't have a real connection between them, we have a virtual connection because the actions of one part of the intelligent edge are controlled by affected by the other parts of the intelligent edge and by the intelligent cloud. And they're all sending messages between each other, like that. And we need parallel computing to achieve high performance on large machine learning and simulation. We need distributed system technology to build the ether and support the distributed and the connected nuggets. The nuggets are particular machine learning codes. And this way, I actually say it's this old concept of computational grid, but it's a data grid. And the computations are there because you are doing computing on, I mean, actually on the edge, you're going to do computing to interpret, if necessary, your image to tell the robot to really stop and don't collide with the, what is about to collide with. So it's a supercomputer aimed at data intensive AI enriched problems. So in the world I live in, we're increasingly looking at the integration of machine learning and simulations. And machine learning is amazing. Um, namely, it can, the machine learning can actually help you with the AI. It can tell you how to configure the AI. There's an amazing paper which learns how to build an index from the data. And that learned index is much better than the best theoretical index, which is based on most conservative or most optimistic assumptions. This is this uh, paper here, the case for learned in this structure from MIT and Google. And so we have this rather scary but inevitable situation. The global AI and modeling supercomputer is controlling itself. And it's going to use itself to, to optimize its execution for both analytics and simulations. And so we can imagine that actually Instead of just doing AI like we're doing it here as a sort of standalone entity, we can imagine that AI will be everywhere. Every action we take will be watched on by an AI wrapper. So it's like having a little human brain around every computer. And that brain is just watching that computer and telling it how to do a better job. And it might even be able to use deep learning and actually learn the results of the computer and instead of calling the computer to do something, it just looks it up and says, hmm, I've already learned this. Here's the answer. And that's, and that's why it's sort of intelligently in, interpolating between previous invocations of that computer. So there is a digital continuum. That's what BDEC calls it, Big Data and Exascale Computing Consortium. And that's the intelligent ether learning from and informing the interconnected computational actions. So this is a big challenge. You could say that's what all these systems are designed to do. And we need to actually understand how to wrap every computing. Everything we do needs to be wrapped with machine learning. So, exciting. Um, so the research I do, I don't have, um, is trying to use high performance computing and also the big data technology, <coughs> or this wonderful Apache technology like Hadoop and Spark and Storm and Heron. And originally we used uh, high performance computing to make the machine learning run faster, to make TensorFlow run fast, or SkyKit learn to run faster. But uh, that's sort of understood, there's still lots of work to be done, but I think the basic principles are understood. And we now look at this different idea in more detail of actually putting machine learning around every computational entity and uh, you use that machine learning to configure that entity and to learn the results of the entity. And so 
we have an amazing parallel system with lots of little nuggets doing different things. And each of those nuggets has AI on it. So we can learn locally what's going on. It's just not learning the global average of the system is going to wrap around each edge device and learn what that, that particular edge device is doing. And we have to integrate everything together. And there's a lot of interesting challenges from parallel computing and machine learning to make this work well. So now we just um, remind you what Hadoop Dart did. It provided important data management features. It interfaced with the data sets with the computing using HTFS. And it had this important idea that the computing on the data was a bunch of maps running independently. And that those maps produce results, which were then handed through um, the shuffle operation, the combine, and the merge to um, reduce um, tasks which combine the results of all these different maps. And this was scalable, horizontally scalable, uh, which gave you scalable SQL databases, which are more cost effective than previous approaches. Uh, the Hadoop tried to do machine learning directly to a project called Mahout, but that turned out to be too clumsy. Um, it has add-ons like Apache Pig to make multiple Hadoops run together, and Uzi did the similar thing. But um, those are not probably quite the most popular approach these days. People think it is better to use Hadoop for what Hadoop does well. But for the real challenge of the global AI and modeling supercomputer, different technologies are necessary.